we saw how two planets were discovered as wanderers. Uranus was discovered by Herschel because he could point his own telescope, see impacts in the sky night after night, looking for any small, subtle changes that persisted for a long time. Neptune was discovered only because it was predicted to exist because of problems with the location of Uranus. Now, we're going to see how a failure in the scientific process led to both the discovery and the misidentification of Pluto. And it will sound very similar to the way we found Uranus and Neptune. But then we'll see how the scientific process, once it corrected itself, ended up in Pluto eventually being classified where it should be and where it belongs. The beginning of this story of Pluto is familiar. A planet not in the right place. Remember, Neptune's equations of gravity showed that Uranus's orbit was incorrect. It was being tugged by another planet. So you either say the equations of gravity are wrong, or you say another planet exists. So we said another planet exists, we looked at where it should be, and there it was. As we studied Neptune, we found that Neptune was not quite in the right place either. Now, the errors in Neptune's orbit were small, and they were controversial. There were some people who thought they were so small they didn't really exist. However, there was enough people looking at those errors in Neptune's orbit that they were able to work out that if they are true, it might be because of the existence of another planet even further out dragging on Neptune. And so began the search for the so-called planet X. The planet X just means next one out. Note, the errors were in the Neptune's orbit were so small that the predicted location of this planet X was not very well constrained, i.e. you couldn't just say it was at a particular point in space. Instead, you had to say it was in a region of the sky somewhere, but not quite sure where. So it wasn't just a matter of pointing a telescope at a spot and finding it. Instead, you had to search for large areas of the sky for a long, long period of time in order to see whether or not this object existed. And this was the thing that was actually dragging on Neptune. And that takes us to Clyde Tombaugh, 1930. Because Neptune's orbit showed some irregularities, another planet was predicted somewhere, so sets in motion a series of events that would eventually lead to the discovery by Clyde Tombaugh of Pluto. The actual story starts with this guy. This is Percy Lavelle. He was a wealthy Bostonian entrepreneur. In other words, he was a very rich guy. How rich was he? He was so rich that he was able to build his own observatory dedicated to trying to find Pluto. He wanted to have a planet named after him. Now, he died in 1916, and after he died, there was somewhat of a uh, fracas over his estate. That was finally sorted, and other members of his family took on the project in 1920, rebuilt the observatory, got it finished, and tried to hire an astronomer to do the job of searching those large parts of the sky for a long period of time to try to find this planet X. But he couldn't get an astronomer to do the job. No tenured astronomer or research astronomer wanted to spend 20 years of their life searching large parts of the sky for one little spot that may not even exist. However, he was at the world to hire this young farm boy from Kansas. Now, this young farm boy from Kansas, by Tombo, was an excellent engineer. He showed a real aptitude for problem solving and a real knack for particular optical engineering building things to track things and find things. And that's exactly the skill set they needed for working at this observatory to try to find this planet X. So Clyde Tombaugh came to the Lovell Observatory in Arizona, and he spent some time setting up the optics, setting up a few clever ideas in order to try to find it. And lo and behold, March 14th, 1930, front page of the New York Times, the ninth planet greater than Earth was found. Now look at this story. New discovery bears out calculations of Lovell. Well, that's not quite correct. It did pay someone to do it. And this is the most important discovery since that of Neptune. 
i.e. this was an exoplanet that was found. Look at the next line. Savants think it may be bigger than Jupiter. Savants think it may be bigger than Jupiter. Well, savants is quite an old word. We don't use that word anymore. It basically means clever people. Think it may be bigger than Jupiter. Why would clever people get Pluto so wrong? Why would, think it, why would they think it to be so big when today we know that it's tiny? What happened in the scientific process to lead to that error? Well, let's look at that thought process. Let's look at that thought process that led to Tombaugh not just finding it, but classifying it and becoming as famous as he did um, for this discovery. Because when he found it, as he did, that took us to the setup we know today, which is the nine planets. Now look, we've misclassified things before, right? We've misclassified from the very beginning, we misclassified the moon and the sun as a planet. Then Brahe put the Earth back out of the planet club. And then we misclassified the four plus some other number of asteroids as planets when they weren't. So it is unusual for us to misclassify objects as planets and then have to find a different classification for them. That is, we've been doing that since the ancient Greeks. But what happened in this case that all the clever people got Pluto so incorrect? Why was it called a planet and then not called a planet? Well, it's all to do with the way planets are found. Remember we talked about you find a planet by looking by changes in the background sky. Discovering planets is actually very much like discovering asteroids. And indeed, the way we discovered Pluto was based on the technology that was invented to try to study asteroids. Here's a picture of an asteroid moving. All the other dots in that movie are stars. If you take a picture of that portion of sky every night, you'll see the same stars in the same place relative to each other because they're so far away, they don't move relative to each other. But objects close to us, do move relative to that background star pattern. And that's how you find them. You look for objects that move from night to night, or week to week, or month to month, or year to year, or whatever it takes. You look for objects that move a little bit. And then you call those solar system objects and you try and figure out what they are. Here are the two images that Clyde Tombaugh used to find Pluto. So this first image was an image of the portion of sky taken on January 29th, 1930. Notice the big objects are not big, they're just bright. And because they're bright, the light has bled across the image. This is an old photographic plate. So this is just overexposed. The image you now see in the left is from six days earlier, January 23rd, 1930. You can compare the star fields. Here's the two big stars at the top and then a big one bottom left. Two big stars at the top, a big one bottom left. You can start going through patterns and trying to find stars that exist in both places. And then you can start looking for stars or an object that exists in one image and has moved in the other image. And that's hard. I dare you to pause this video and stare at that screen to try to find an object that is somewhere in the image on the left, and it's somewhere different on the image on the right. It's a very hard thing to do. You'll go crazy, especially if you don't even know there is a difference. This is like the world's worst spot the difference competition. This is the spot the difference competition where there may not be a difference. There might be only a difference that would, you might only see the difference if you observe these two star fields months apart or years apart, not days apart. And you have to do this for all the different parts of the sky because it covers a broad area of the sky. Clyde Tombaugh built a blinking machine, a machine that would take one of these photographic plates and show it and then slide in a second one and then slide that out and slide it in, slide it out and slide it in, essentially blinking between the two images. And that enabled him to go through pairs of photographic plates pretty quickly and by eye try to spot objects that existed in one and not the other and then follow those objects up to see whether or not that was a real thing or whether that was a problem with his photographs or a problem with his engineering or a problem with his optics or a fly in the lens or something. There was a lot of things that could be beyond the planet. You have to rule all those things out before you could claim to be a planet. 
Let me blink, as Clay Tombaugh, Clay Tombaugh did, between the two images. So look now on the left. I'm blinking between the two images on the 23rd and the 29th. Do you see Pluto? It's hard. Let me point out too. There's Pluto on the 23rd, and there's Pluto on the 29th. Very difficult to spot that. But that little dot and that other little dot, that's Pluto having moved through the star field in those six days. Here's another series of blinking images. This time is set right on top of each other. So you can see Pluto was inside that little red dot on the left. And then when I blink to the next image, it's now inside a little dot on the right, left, right, left, right. Really, really hard. The reason it was so hard was because it was very, very faint. Really, really faint. Too faint. And that was the problem. And that's why they thought it was really, really big. Why is faintness, lack of brightness, connected to an estimate of mass? Well, what control the brightness of any solar system object as we see it on Earth? We've done this question before. There's only three things that determine how bright something looks. Remember, there's only one bright, there's only one light source in the solar system, it's the sun. So what controls the brightness of any solar system object? How far has the light had to travel to get from the sun to the object and back to Earth? How big is the object? I mean, i.e., how much light does it reflect back? And how reflective is it? Is it shiny like a mirror or is it dark like a piece of coal? That's it. So if an object is extremely dim, either it's really much further away than we thought it was, or it's much, much smaller than we thought it all was, or it's much, much darker than we thought it was. We knew Pluto's distance pretty well. And so you can work out how dark it should be or how bright it should be by looking at its distance. Pluto was found to be much darker than could be explained by its distance alone, meaning it must be either very much non-reflective or very, very, very small. Pluto was assumed to be so big that it's interfering with the orbit of Neptune. And it was interfering with the orbit of Neptune, it must have a huge mass. And if it's a huge mass, then the only reason left you could explain why it was so dim is it must be really, really dark. That's why they thought it might be bigger than Jupiter. They assumed it had to be big in order to interfere with Neptune. So what solution do you pose for its dimness? You say that it's really, really dark. The problem became when we learned out more about the object. Pluto was found to be extremely icy, very icy. Icy objects are bright. Once you find out Pluto is very, very bright, then the only way of explaining that it's very dim is it cannot be big. Instead, it must be small, really small. And the more icy we find Pluto was, the smaller we had to pull down the estimates of Pluto's mass. Which means this is not the planet X people were searching for. Planet X, if it's there, had to be big. And this is not big. There was not enough mass here in this object to be tugging on Neptune. So where is planet X? Well, Neptune's mass and its orbit were measured more precisely later in the 20th century. That resulted in even smaller corrections required. And then when we applied Einstein's general relativity laws to Neptune's orbit, the relativity corrections were able to account for even those very small corrections. And so really, there isn't a need for planet X. Neptune is where it should be. It doesn't mean people have stopped searching. There's still a feeling that there are other big objects out there and they're tugging on similar objects. And this idea of looking at objects' orbits and seeing if they differ from where they should be is still very much alive today. But the big planet X idea is not alive today, not where it should have been. There's no need for that original planet X. 
So, so what? It's small. Is it a planet? Well, thinking about Pluto is it was always different. It's not just that its mass is very small, it's really small. It's 20 times smaller in mass than the smallest known planet, Mercury. That makes it tiny. Pluto is also weird in that it's so icy that it's mostly icy rock. Remember, the terrestrial planets are mostly rock and metals. The Jovian planets are mostly gaseous. But at Pluto was icy rock. There's no other planets at that distance that are icy rock. The other weird thing about Pluto was its orbit. Pluto's orbit is both inclined significantly and eccentric. What do you mean by inclined? Well, all of the planets tend to go around in the same plane, except for Pluto, which is tilted about 17 degrees with respect to the rest of the planets. It's got a high inclination orbit, like those weird moons around Jupiter. It's got a high, highly eccentric orbit. Here's the orbit on the right-hand side, see the orbit of Earth, almost a perfect circle, the orbit of Neptune, almost a perfect circle. Look at the orbit of Pluto. It's so eccentric that sometimes it's much further away from the sun than Neptune is, and other times it's actually closer to the sun than Neptune is. So here we have this weird small mass, icy rock, highly inclined, eccentric orbit object that's far away. There are objects like that out there. The objects we know of that are out there that are small mass, icy rock with inclined orbits and their significant eccentric orbits are comets. So one of the original ideas for classifying Pluto was instead of saying, is Pluto a planet, say, well, maybe Pluto is a comet. Its mass similar to comets. Its composition is similar to comets. His orbit is inclined and is significant, significantly eccentric. It feels more like a comet than a planet. But when you compare it to other comets, then it's not a comet. Sure, it has a small mass, but it's still much, much, much bigger than the comets we know. Sure, it's got a eccentric orbit, but it's still much, much more circular than the comets we know of. Sure, it's got an inclined orbit, but it's still less inclined than the comets we know of. And perhaps the most telling one, Pluto's got a moon. We don't have any comets with moons. So if Pluto is not a comet, then what can it be? The only classification we had left was planet. And as long as it wasn't a comet, and as long as there was no other word to describe it, then I was determined, let's call it planet. <laughs>